Hello. We have two stories today. Our first mixes pro revenge with military might and someone with an ego the size of the United States military spending budget. With that level of entitlement, it isn't long until they do something so embarrassing it's almost irresistible to make public. And publicly embarrassing the military is one thing no one will ignore. Story one. So this happened about one and a half years ago, but I recently heard the news on how far my revenge went. I was a Navy enlisted service member and was stationed in Yokosuka, Japan for a few years before I got transferred back stateside. I worked in the main hospital that cared for service members and their beneficiaries. It's a small hospital, so everyone knows everyone. Shortly after I left, I caught wind of a new physician officer working in the radiology department. My friends would say he's horrible to work with, but that's nothing new. However, someone saw him print a letter and he left it on his desk and took a picture of it and sent it to me. He's requesting to move from enlisted housing to officer. Edit. Found out it's not a private letter, he did actually send it to housing, and most of housing is ran by enlisted members. For context, military housing is available for those who are married, have a family, or are qualified based on their rank, and depending on the military base itself. Typically, officer housing is much nicer than the enlisted. In Yokosuka, housing is basically the same all around because it's overseas. But most of the housing are apartments, and each apartment complex is called a tower. Example, Fuji Tower. There are nine towers and two are for officers since enlisted members outnumber officers by a lot. Now, one thing about the military, stuff happens. When getting stationed, it is the active duty member's responsibility to either apply for housing on or off base before arriving, depending on what is allowed. If there is limited space and you don't apply for housing on time, then you get put where there is space. So our new officer got placed in an enlisted tower. Mind you, enlisted members have families of their own and other officers have been placed in enlisted housing before without an issue. Here are some quotes in his letter, and yes, this guy has a PhD. I have many valid objections to living in a building of almost all enlisted and even many lower enlisted being an officer. There is a lot of crime, violent actions, drug use, and alcoholism that happen in enlisted housing. There are also unmentionable assaults and other pervs. I have a good-looking family, a wife, and two daughters aged three and four. They are prime targets to be victims for these enlisted deviant activities. My family should be safe in housing that is with officers. Officers are much more respectable in these types of deviant activities are incredibly rare compared to the deviant activities of enlisted being commonplace. Other officer families will not want to visit us because our family lives on enlisted housing. My children need to make friends with other officer children. My wife needs to make friends with other officers' wives. I need to make friends with other officers. Forcing an officer to live in a large apartment building with almost all enlisted is unethical. You get the idea. So this guy basically looks down on all enlisted service members, assuming every single one are drug users, pervs, criminals, etc. <laughs> the kicker? He was an enlisted army member before going to officer school. In civilian terms, think of a manager that discriminates and calls all of his subordinates criminals, violent, alcoholics, pervs, drug users, etc. based on your job position. Forgetting that some have a family and, you know, maybe aren't any of those things. And he not only has the authority to ruin your work life, he can ruin your personal life. Deny days off, make you stay late, write you up if he doesn't like you, and not letting you promote. Safe to say everyone was peeved and I have nothing to lose. I was separating soon and figured I'd have some fun before I get out. I created a burner Facebook account and posted the letter and the officer's picture on a popular military enlisted group page. Within two days, it spread like wildfire. But I wasn't done yet. The military has something called challenge coins. Think of trading cards, but custom coins that come in many shapes and sizes. I designed one with his face and a big middle finger in the back. On top of that, I designed stickers to show how proud us deviants are. Other coin designs came from other people as well, but so far, I think mine was more popular. I sold over 70 coins to the initial person who originally sent me the picture at a huge discounted price, so she can sell them for a profit for herself. So the officer's face is everywhere because most people keep their coins displayed on their desk. No matter where the officer went at work, he would see his face on someone's desk. And 
since it didn't have his name on the coin, can't officially say it's him. I sold more stateside and even some got sent to Europe. I made about $3,000 overall, which was nice. The story even got featured on the online naval newspaper and on two popular YouTube channels. And if you're military, you know the only time big military care is when it's too big to sweep under the rug. This story got the officer sent up to captain's mast, which is like Navy court. He tried to say his wife was the one that wrote the letter, but no one is buying it because her writing style is way worse. She even tried to take the fall, but no one believed her. They both ended up deleting all social media. Due to this, he got served three UCMJ articles, which basically are his offenses. But there's more. When you're in the military, you have a deadline on how long you can be a certain rank. If you don't pick up, then you're kicked out. And because he's new and got served UCMJ articles, he won't be up for promotion and therefore was involuntarily separated. Also, the officer program he went through pays for his PhD. When the military pays for your PhD, you have to serve 10 years to pay them back. If you don't complete 10 years, you have to pay the military back with money instead of time. So, he lost his job and now has to pay back the military for his PhD. And since it takes a while for the paperwork to have him and his family sent back stateside, you can bet he socially suffered because no one worked with him. Edit. The hatchet became a symbol of enlisted deviance because his letter stated that two gangs were attacking each other with hatchets and other weapons at an enlisted housing unit. In the comments, Brownmitt said, I remember when this got international press attention. All the Navy said was he had been disciplined but would not release details. Thanks for giving the rest of the story. OP replied, I found out from buddies who were stationed there when it all went down and angry cops did a (laughs) follow-up. Angry Cops is a really huge military content-themed channel, if anyone is interested. Look to Windward said, The thing OP is leaving out is that the lieutenant in question actually did send the letter, which would have been pretty bad even without it being leaked. OP added, Oh crap, he sent it? My source didn't tell me that. Background War said, I remember being in Yokosuka in the early 2000s. It was great if you were a young, single officer living off base. I later heard things got insane. Like you have to submit liberty plans for approval, even if your plan was a quiet weekend at home. You can run into narcissists in the military and it's worse since they have legal authority over you. It's always a warm feeling when these guys get what they deserve. Not what Waffles added, I was in Tokyo in 2000. The liberty plans really trapped you on base if you suddenly wanted to hit a club. Spontaneous actions were a no-go. At one point, we had to list exactly where we planned to go, even if staying on base crappy time. It really is scary to think of the power wielded by some people who shouldn't have authority in the military. But it's truly heartwarming to see how OP would not stand for it. The coins are the real cake topper here, though. They will serve as a reminder in perpetuity of what can happen if you utterly disrespect your fellow service members, regardless of your rank. Our second story mixes Hollywood entitlement with the Deep South in a regional folktale that became local legend. Even more fun is that this revenge was memorialized on the big screen and will forever be a part of history for everyone to see. Story 2 Please allow me to note well in advance this story is not mine. In fact, it's a rather popular story in a town I once lived in, Savannah, Georgia, and centers around one homeowner who got royally annoyed with a movie producer. There will be a note at the end about the fellow this story is about, for those interested. Okay, so first and foremost, when movie producers are looking for places to set a movie that takes place in colonial or even 1800 cities in the US, due to the sheer number of parks, wide roads, and period houses, they will often select Savannah, Georgia. They'll pull all the Spanish moss out of the trees or trim it back, pour dirt on the roads, around the squares, and effectively backdate that part of the city to fit most any place, even up to some having used the area as a setting for places like early Washington, D.C., and even places in Britain or France. Typically, when producers do this, they will pay each homeowner whose house is used as background flavor a couple thousand dollars for the licensing to do so. That will be important later, trust me. They issue some rules, like no electrical lights being visible, not coming out of any door that faces the street, and you have to move your automobiles away from the drive, if you have a drive. Well, 1979, a producer came from Hollywood with the intention of using Savannah for that very purpose. 
Specifically, the producer was from one of the big three-letter TV channels and was working on making a made-for-TV movie, talking about the events after the assassination of Lincoln and the subsequent accusations of the doctor present at his death. The production went to the city to seek permission and then sent an announcement out to each of the homeowners telling them of the various days that the shoot was going to take place. However, much to their downfall, they also noted that the production company would not be compensating the homeowners for the use of their homes as backdrops. This was met with some great annoyance by the homeowners, who turned to the city for help, only to be told that it was their civic duty to allow the use of their homes. Most everyone agreed to this and bit their lips. One homeowner, however, didn't. He decided to get revenge on the production, attempting to screw up their shooting every chance he got. He first started by leaving his car out in front of his house, only to have it towed before filming started. He threatened legal action against the studio, but that fell on deaf ears. He forbade the use of his home in some of the shots, but the production company got the city to make him back down. Eventually, enough was enough, so he waited biding his time until he was certain they were filming. When the day came that his house was being used as a background shot, the homeowner grabbed a massive red World War II German flag and hung it out front of the house out of one of the top windows. The production company balked. They knew that this ruined any shot they'd use there. And what's more, they started to question just when he'd put the flag up. Was it just the one day or had all the previous shots? some which showed the house from across the square been ruined as well. They turned to the city for help, and the city just basically shrugged, saying that it was his First Amendment right to do that, and implied that had the production company paid the homeowners, as had always been done before, then this probably wouldn't have happened. In the end, the production company had to end shooting and go to the homeowner begging for him to remove the offensive flag. (laughs) He did eventually do so, but only after his lawyer got a contract in writing that required the production company to pay all the homeowners for having their homes in the shot. The flag came down and shooting wrapped in less than a day. Interestingly, it's said that in the movie in question, The Ordeal of Dr. Mudd, there are several shots where you can see a bright red World War II flag flying from one of the homes in the distance. That stunt cost a producer quite a substantial amount of money and push production back at least a year, while they tried to find every single instance that the flag flew in the background shots. This homeowner would go on to himself become very famous, though not for a good reason. Even so, he lives on among the legends of that city both for his revenge against a movie producer and his later brush with fame. The fellow in question is none other than Jim Williams. Williams was an American antiques dealer and a historic preservationist based in Savannah, Georgia. He played an active role in the preservation of the Savannah Historic District for over 35 years. Williams was arrested on May 2, 1981, for the alleged murder of 21-year-old Danny Hansford, with whom he had been having a homosexual relationship at Mercer House. After the subsequent four trials, a record in the state of Georgia, Williams was finally acquitted by a jury in Augusta in May 1989, eight years after his arrest. Williams died in 1990 of heart failure, though AIDS is also suspected. He is the center of the story, Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil novel, and later, Clint Eastwood's movie. In the comments, Tipsana said, Wikipedia says he didn't ask to be paid himself. He had asked for a donation to be made to the local Humane Society. Producers declined. OP replied, I didn't know that. Though from everything I've heard about him, that does seem like something he'd have done. Smooth said, I read the first paragraph and the book Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil popped in my head. Then I read the spoiler. Boom, I'm good. OP replied, yeah, to this day, when movies come to film in Savannah, the story is used as an example of why you don't hesitate to pay the homeowners. Firad added, my aunt lived in Savannah for years, and I remember hearing this story around the time that Forrest Gump was filmed as an example of why movie producers knew to compensate the homeowners there for their inconvenience. I did not know anything about Jim Williams at the time, though just that it was some guy who collected historical artifacts and restored a lot of older homes. Eclectics said, I mean, the not paying thing is crappy, but it really boils my blood that they were able to tow his car and then he couldn't do anything about it. Slippy Dippy Tippy added, it says he left it in front of his house. So it may be a city owns the road, city says you have to move. OP added, honestly, 
Jim was rather open about his sexuality. Well, in that it was something of a secret, sure, but a secret that every person knew about. At that time, in the Deep South, homosexuality was still criminalized in many areas, and honestly, police weren't exactly inclined to help a citizen who was as open as Jim was. So if a movie producer wants a car towed, and it just so happens to be the car owned by a known homosexual man, you bet the car is getting towed, whether the owner likes it or not. Well, that's one way to send a message and make your street undesirable. And how lucky the guy just happens to be a historian who likes to collect World War II memorabilia. He had the perfect tool for the job to show up these bougie Hollywood producers who thought they could pay these people for all the inconvenience with exposure. Well, this guy gave them some exposure, all right. The kind that takes years to scrub away, and even then, you still can't get rid of it all. Like a rash that just won't go away. It's this kind of stuff that makes you a local legend. That, and committing a high-profile murder. But that's a story for another day. If you've enjoyed the story and would like to hear more, consider liking, subscribing, and leaving a comment. Thanks, and bye for now.